Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this afternoon's webinar, which is Neurophysiotherapy, Minimising Brain Loss in MS and the Effect of Exercise. And I'm really delighted today we've got Jilly Davy presenting for us. And I'm Nicola Graham. I'm the facilitator for today's webinar. So we'd like to um, do our acknowledgements. We acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians past and present on whose lands we meet today. And we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. So I'd like to introduce you to Jilly Davy. So Jilly is the founder and director of MS Get a Head Start, which is a program Jilly will touch on today. She's a consulting neurological physiotherapist and clinical director of Connect Neurophysiotherapy. Jill is passionate about the changing world of physical rehabilitation and exercise for people with multiple sclerosis. And the program MS Get a Head Start um, has been uh, Jilly's brainchild, which she started in 2012, and she researched, trialed, and developed the MS Get a Head Start program um, by pulling together a wide range of evidence-based approaches and combining um, the unique approach of interval training, exercise, education, and self-management. Jilly graduated in the UK in 2004. She's worked in the UK, Australia, and she's currently presenting today from New Zealand. And she's worked in public and private practice. Jilly was awarded the Australian Physiotherapy Association Ipsen Special Commendation for Achievement in Neurological Physiotherapy in 2015. And in 2016, Jilly was awarded an honorary clinical fellowship for the Australian Catholic University. So just want to draw your attention to the informed choice and I will hand over to Jilly. Thank you very much Nicola. I'm just waiting for the screen to come over. Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining us. Fantastic. Okay so and um, now I am just having a few issues with my webcam so as I can understand you can all see me but I can't see me so Nicola is going to let me know if I suddenly disappear off screen or anything um, and I do as Nicola said I really hope that we make this quite an interactive session being even though it is online and webinar based so if you've got any questions and bits and pieces then I'll probably stop talking and bring my webinar up just so I can interact with you a little bit better so um, first of all, a huge thank you to, um, to MS Connect in Australia for inviting me. It's always a privilege and a really exciting opportunity to talk to other health professionals about something that I am sure you are all just as passionate about as I am, which is making a difference to the individuals that we work with and you know the knock on effect that that has. So we're gonna be talking about the powerful impact of exercise. So again, thank you, Nicola, for a really lovely introduction. So she's kind of covered that. The thing that I often like to just start a little bit with at the start of my presentation so people get a better feeling about me um, is I am a clinician. So I am a full time clinician. So everything that I often deliver um, in my teaching and kind of you know, approach is always about clinical application. So yes, I'm gonna go through quite a bit of research bits and pieces today. Obviously my clinical practice is very much um, molded by research, but I will definitely be giving you lots of practical skills and food for thought that is gonna affect you guys as treating clinicians. And that is because I'm at that cold face and doing that, you know, hands-on treatment um, all the time. So the two main um, companies obviously I'm involved with is I obviously have launched MS Get a Head Start, but the clinical and the consulting based company I run is Connect Neurophysiotherapy, where I have a full time private clinic based in Auckland in New Zealand. Hence, that's where I'm presenting from. And um, if anyone asks me what really is my main drive, it's about providing hope. I do believe anyone living with a neurological condition that times have changed. You know, the research reflects that is that they need to be provided better hope and more hope because there is a hope. 
there is a much more positive outcomes lying there waiting for them than there ever used to be. Um, but they don't know that and it's our job as health professionals to reinstall that hope. Because if you don't have hope, then it's really hard to aspire for anything better. So as mentioned and by Nicola and myself, if you do have any questions, type away, ask away, and I will answer as much as I can. But today we are going to be discussing the effect of exercise on the brain and, and kind of, guide, as I say, going through some guidelines and some practical application of what you can do for that. So we're going to be talking about high intensity interval training because this um, is really starting to make quite a move in the treatment of MS and it's something that MS Get a Head Start is all pivoted around. So we'll talk a little bit about what is the actual um, influences of high intensity and how you can create it. Uh, we're going to go through more of kind of that um, latest evidence and knowledge around exercise specifically for brain health. Um, but also try and go through some of the barriers because it's all well and good that we can preach as health professionals about you must be exercising, but there's a lot of barriers around exercise. So we're going to go through a couple of those ones, you know, for you as well. And a real passion of mine and something I'm going to touch on a lot today is the new, newly diagnosed, you know, why are we not treating them? As, off, as soon as we actually could be. Why are we often picking individuals up, okay, when they are five, 10 years down the line, when they're already having quite significant issues with their participation and their quality of life? So, and I believe that's a massive role that we have to undertake as health professionals in driving that, um, you know, that referral systems earlier. So let's start, the real, shocking part about when you look up anything about MS and activity levels, that 80% of individuals living with MS are completely inactive. Now we're talking about physical activity here, we're not even talking about exercise. So if we have 80% who are completely inactive, then we obviously know that they're not doing any form of structured exercise either. Now, what is even more shocking, well, I think even more shocking about this figure is that this figure has not changed for 25 years. Now, we know that evidence behind exercise and our treatment of neurological conditions is radically different to what it was 25 years ago. And we, the, the, the individual living with MS has not been the recipient at the end of the day of any of those um, movements forward that we believe has happened. So I really, as a health professional, take this on as, as shocking and absolutely as something that we are on the, you know, are on the back foot about actually treating at the moment and how do we really get onto the front foot and start actively making a massive impact on that figure, like 80% inactivity is huge. Um, and this is, as I say, despite you know all the the great evidence out there that um that has shown that exercise is really impactful so why you know just we're going to come over the why in more detail later in the talk but just to kind of get you thinking a little bit is who gives you a manual you get diagnosed with this life-changing neurological condition by a neurologist or you know generally by a neurologist some cases you may be uh, inferred it by your gp initially no one gives you a manual hopefully you've been referred to your local you know the individual's been referred to a local ms society or something for some support but no one gives them a manual about how to exercise what to do how to manage their fatigue they are just overwhelmed with the fact that they've just been diagnosed with um you know a neurological condition and then you follow that up with a really poor referral rate like who is out there getting individuals referred, every individual newly diagnosed with MS referred to your clinic door. Um, now you may do, and if you do, that is amazing. Um, we're getting better um, connections, myself and a neurologist who I work with here at Auckland, so I am picking up more brand new at diagnosis, but the issue is as a private service provider, that obviously has barriers itself. But what we've got is fear. 
Um, I have got MS um, clients who often tell me about the the chat that they've read in their, you know, MS forums and the online chat rooms because there's a lot of information out there for individuals with MS on the internet. And they will tell me about, you know, someone's jumped on the chat and said, hey everyone, never buy an exercise bike. It gives you wobbly legs. I couldn't walk afterwards. Worst thing ever. And all these people are suddenly online going, oh great, thanks for that advice. I won't get a bike. You know, and obviously as health professionals, we're like, oh no. So there's a still huge fear about exercise making things worse. Um, and then both as an individual living with MS, but also as a health professional, there's a huge amount of inconsistency. You know, um, individuals with MS are really unsure what is the right way to exercise. And there is a lack of a consistent approach across the board between what a doctor is saying, what a neurologist is saying, what is a physio saying compared to a personal trainer, an exercise physiologist, etc. So we've got you know this inconsistency that even as health professionals it's often quite hard if you've decided to um specialize as one would say in ms where do you go to specialize sorry excuse me <coughs> you know apart from doing your own research and finding out information yourself not many people are out there running you know ms courses you know how to upskill in ms specific knowledge apart from obviously these great webinars that have been shown here but there is you know there is a lack of resources out there so lots of reasons here starting to say why an individual with ms is um is not active and definitely areas that we can jump on straight away now um one of the 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 things i was asked i i use this uh, slide a lot but it was in the uh, the criteria of providing a presentation today was to give you something to go away and reflect about so as the audience to give you something as a clinician to start reflecting about your own practice and the individuals you treat and this is a statement that I would like you to think about and go away thinking about is there's a real question now in the MS research world, is what is a primary impairment? So when a client you know, or patient comes in to see you and they are complaining about difficulties that they are having functioning, is it a primary neurological impairment? So an impairment specifically due to the demyelination on a specific point in their gray matter compared to a secondary impairment compared to the thing well, what we all know the most is if you don't use it you lose it okay and as soon as you stop being very active okay your activity levels change because you cannot bank exercise or activity you are going to start getting this cycling of reduced mobility and decreased physical activity that is then going to cycle between further neurodegenerative processes. And I believe this is a really interesting thing to think about. And when I was reading about this um, topic and listening to a few researchers talking about it, it really makes you think that the pretty dramatic improvements and sometimes not even dramatic, the general improvements that you are probably seeing as a health professional in your clinic or your place of treatment. Are you changing their primary impairment or are you changing a secondary impairment? And I can tell you now, I've treated a lot of individuals with MS that I'm going to tell you, I have not met an individual where I have completely improved all their secondary impairments. So the only thing that is um, limiting us from further improvement as a primary impairment. I have not achieved that in anyone yet because I truly believe everyone has a human body that could be fitter, stronger, and you know, more dynamic, better reactions through the training effects of exercise. Um, before we start actually getting to that pivotal ceiling effect of a primary impairment. 
Um, so some good research um, that's been brought out recently um, by, I uh, cannot necessarily pronounce this name correctly, Ryman Schneider. Now all the, um, if you've got your handouts, all these references are in full at the back of the handouts. Is um, a really interesting um, talk about is the newly diagnosed um, an overlooked window of opportunity that the um, most recent kind of the, the studies um, that the earliest diagnosis that research studies are being performed on individuals are at 2.5 years post diagnosis. Now with MS, to have MS, you would have had to have gone to the doctor because you were having an issue about something. You've got numbness, you've got chronic pain, some radiating pain shooting down one side of the body, you're tripping over, you've got cognitive changes, you've got optic neuritis, you know, there is something that has happened. You already have neurological impairments at diagnosis. Okay, and, and why are we not running any research studies on people until they're over 2.5 years post, okay, regarding exercise? So this is the main slide that I'd like you all to really take on, is the individuals you're treating, how much are you actually treating secondary impairments, and do you actually believe you've treated all of their secondary impairments? So brain atrophy. Um, now, there's no timelines on those pictures there, but basically what I want to highlight a couple of things on brain atrophy, specifically in MS, that it's about 40 to 70 percent of individuals with MS will have cognitive changes. So 40 to 70 percent. So that's a large percentage. Also, the amount of um, issues that individuals have at diagnosis is massive. And what we know is people have grey and white matter changes already at diagnosis. So this disability um, progression in MS is related to both the grey matter atrophy and that's motor and cognitive. And I do believe that the cognitive element is being overlooked. And the challenge I give to individuals, and because I find it a challenge myself in the health professional world, is as a physio or, um, you know, OTs, I believe you will do this much better, but as a physio, um, exercise physiologist, um, you know, and I believe hopefully OTs and speech therapists are potentially doing it better than we are, is are you doing any cognitive testing on your initial screening? And not many physios do. And how do you know if you know what you are essentially treating and if you're having an impact on that? So um, there's some simple tests like the trail maker test that can be done clinically. Um, you know, you just do it's it's all available um, online, and that's quite a nice quick cognitive test, trial maker test, um, to actually do some cognitive screening at your initial assessments. But things to be aware of is that the brain atrophy has been observed really early. So at diagnosis, there is brain atrophy obvious in MS. What they found, though, there's some differences in the brain atrophy and they're, they're starting to move towards um, trying to be able to define the different um, MS phenotypes better regarding relapsing and remitting primary progressive and secondary progressive, depending on where the, the atrophy is. So this um, the study just out in 2019 by Decker et al was quite interesting that with MRI scans they're now showing that um, individuals or patients with relapse onset have severe deep atrophy whereas progressive MSET, MS um, is showing more clusters of um, increased grey matter lesions. So the relapsing or emitting do not seem to show clusters. They seem to just show one deep atrophy area, whereas secondary progressive MS um, are showing increased clusters around a cerebral lesion load. And the primary progressive seem to be through the cerebral, sorry, the cere yeah, the cerebral and the cerebellar cortex. So this is just really to highlight that we're you know, the brain atrophy is there at diagnosis. Are we testing it clinically? 
okay, to know if our input is having an effect. Um, and that I think this is a massive area where the research is only going to get better and our diagnosis of the phenotypes, et cetera, is going to improve. Um, what's um, interesting also is um, picked up in one of the other studies there is that cognitive decline is not always associated with brain loss. So yes, someone may have some brain atrophy cha changes. It doesn't always mean that that is what's causing some of their cognitive changes. So pictures of the brain. This is a picture I use a lot when I present because that is your arterial blood supply to the brain. And doesn't it look beautiful? And um, what really gets me about this, um, obviously this is a cadaver-based um, artery system here, is how dense the capillary of the arterial blood supply is around that brain. So an area that I really um, pull out for clients is that 85% of your brain is water. And I would say nearly every individual with MS is probably living in a form of dehydration, especially when they have incontinence concerns. So if you are not drinking, you know, at least two litres of water a day, your brain is probably not going to be anywhere nice and red and juicy there. So I often say to individuals, your brain probably looks a little like a shriveled raisin, OK, compared to a juicy bunch of grapes. Um, so we can just have a little think of, you know, shriveled raisin, then of course their cognitive function is going to be um, delayed. So exercise is what's obviously going to give you a great amount of blood supply to your brain. And you also need to have a nice hydrated system. Now, if any of you know that when you are feeling tired, dehydrated, let's take an example, if you might be slightly hungover from too many wines the night before, then that shriveled raisin effect makes your brain response pretty slow. Okay, so we all know that this is starting to go into effect. You don't have a good blood supply to your brain. How can the cognitive function be adequate? So neuroplasticity. Now, you guys as health professionals be all over this part of what it is. The elements to remember when we're treating an MS population, that is neuroplasticity is always happening 24 hours a day, that if you start having to alter your gait pattern because you have a form of neuromuscular fatigue in your dorsiflexors, then you are neuroplastically learning a bad habit. And that compensation then becomes a real issue because when it comes to clinically treating you, if that um, your, your client has been walking with a element of right foot drop or decreased ground clearance, let's say because it's a neuromuscular fatigue compared to pure foot drop, um, and a right hyperextending knee, that one session of physio once a week for four weeks or six weeks isn't going to break their habit of their gait pattern. OK, you need to really think about the intensity of practice to create those positive neuroplastic changes. But something that I'd really like to highlight, because I am, um, you know, when you like to talk about hope with MS and like myself, when I talk about all these great things, I truly believe we can provide individuals with MS. There's a hell of a lot of people that want to shoot you down and say that it, there's there's no evidence. Now, neuroplasticity exists in MS because it exists in all of us. When you got di when an individual, sorry, got diagnosed with MS, you don't suddenly stop having a nervous system that is the same as any other human being. It just means your nervous system is compromised. So the certain amount of the body is still going through its normal neuroplastic changes. Okay, the problem is if the axonal damage starts to get more significant, creating new pathways is harder because the axons are too damaged to start with. Neurological protection. Now, this is really important that we understand the terminology. When I'm talking about neurological protection, we're talking about reducing axon dieback. From the age of 25, every human is reducing brain mass, okay, through axon dieback. It is exercise. It is that moderate to vigorous exercise that releases the brain-derived neurotrophic factors and the nerve growth hormones 
that reduces axon dieback, okay? So I think there's a good, um, I've got quite a bit of research papers around me, so um, just so I can quote ones um, specifically as we go. But um, there's a great study by, um, if anyone knows anything about MS research as an exercise, it's Robert Mottor and Brian Sandroff. And they did a fabulous paper they published last year, 2018. Exercise is a countermeasure to declining central nervous system function in MS. And they've got a great statement here where they talk about Exercise training and participation in physical activity are generally accepted as favourable approaches for managing decline in central nervous system structure and function wow. in older adults and general population. Such statements reflect nearly 40 years of research examining physical fitness, activity and exercise training effects on cognition, brain structure and function in older adults from the general population. And essentially in contents is that exercise works in the human brain regarding declining axon dieback and in maintaining cognitive function. So why can't that happen to an individual of MS? Their brain is still acting like any normal human brain is regarding its decline. And what we know is if 80% of individuals with MS are sat around being inactive, then they're not being very protective on their brain. What I'm not talking about with neurological protection, and to get this clear, is we are not talking about stopping or curing the demyelination process of MS. Okay. That is not what I talk about when I talk about neurological protection. And the same when we talk about remyelination is remyelination is really exciting because individuals with MS um, take on the fact that their system is demyelinating and they accept that. And that's all that they understand about it. No one takes them to one side and says to be relapsing and remitting is that where you've had the demyelinated areas, a bunch of those areas will remyelinate because that's how you remit. And I, when I first read that or worked that out a couple of years ago, it was like this light bulb moment of, of course there's remyelination still in MS, because why would you otherwise have relapsing and remitting? Now, the thing about the remyelination, again, if your axons get really damaged, is that remyelination becomes harder and harder. Whereas in the earlier stages of the condition or when people are still you know, moving around well, the remyelination element start, stays, um, stays stronger. The thing that's really important about these three elements is that they're all activity dependent and I can't stress this enough that you know to teach individuals is that they can produce this absolute magic in their brain but to do so they've got to move and this is what the GPs and the neurologists and the nurses and the family members and everyone else has to take on is that yes the medication is okay okay it's starting to do some great things but if you want to create a real positive change, you've got to move. So cardiovascular risk in MS. Um, so we know that uh, there's demyelination process. We know that there is damage at diagnosis with MS because that's what gets picked up on the MRI scans um, and the, the bodies in the lumbar puncture. So we know that there's damage already. Then what we then look at is that because if there's damage already, there seems to be significant cardiovascular fitness decreases, which then causes major cardiometabolic risk factors um, and vascular comorbidity. So this rapid disability progression in MS is essentially, apart from obviously we do have really um, progressive and nasty forms of MS where people progress exceptionally quickly. But if we take the 85% of individuals with MS who start off as relapsing remitting, is that MS doesn't kill people, it's the secondary immobility that kills people. Okay, so again, I go back to the fact that they still have a normal human body, that as soon as you stop moving it, you are going to have all these vascular comorbidity issues. Um, you know, and it talks about people that have 
Um, people with MS have increased serum glucose concentration, impaired glucose tolerance, high insulin resistance, and hyperinsulinemia. So all these ma massive cardiometabolic risk factors. Um, we also know that and then this increased lipoprotein profile is completely associated with MS disease progression, um, lesion formation, and blood barrier dysfunction. The whole reason why an individual has MS to start with is because of a, a brain blood barrier dysfunction. And then we go and pop on top them getting even more unfit, well, then their blood brain barrier gets worse. So, you know, again, you've got to ask, is there progressive MS because of a primary impairment or because it's the inactivity is causing things like their blood brain barrier to decline further, which then causes even further decline to their MS. So it is a real chicken and egg question that you've got to start questioning about, you know, fitness and MS. So then looking at exercise and MS. Now, this is obviously for a webinar. This is this one's got a lot of words on it and it's got a lot of research at the bottom. So apologies, but I've given you all the information so then you can go and look at it yourself in further detail. But what we're saying here is that there is evidence out there. And as I read out from Robert Mottle and, and Brian Sandros paper there, that there has been evidence of nearly over 40 years worth of evidence in the human brain, not necessarily MS specific, but the human brain, that exercise increases brain matter and brain function. When you work at a moderate to vigorous level, okay, so that is about getting out of breath. We need individuals, not only with MS, but every human being to be getting out of breath, puffing and panting for a short controlled period of time, three to four times a week throughout their lifespan. And that doesn't matter whether they're 20 or 90. Okay, it is that that helps their brain health. Also, what happens when you exercise is that you enhance all these inflammatory mechanisms. We know MS is an inflammatory me um, nature. So if we can enhance anti-inflammatory mechanisms, that is going to make symptom presentation better because their system is less inflamed. Where there's reduced relapse rates, reduced lesion volumes and improved neuroperformance have all been reported with exercise programs and MS. Now I'm just going to pick up on a couple of those programs that I've listed down, down there is um, White and Constantin Constantiello, the 2008 paper, that's a really interesting paper that raises, and that's 11 years old now, raising some stuff about considering that the axonal loss and cerebral atrophy occur early in the disease, exercise prescription in the acute stage could promote neuroprotection, neuroregeneration, and neuroplasticity and reduce long-term disability. So when we're talking about brain health here, this isn't new. OK, in the sense that unfortunately it does take 10 to 20 years for research to become clinical practice. And that is now 11 years old. But, you know, the researchers have been talking about, you know, our impact on brain health for a while. You know, there's a lot of animal studies that prove that these um, results happen. And the evidence is still obviously quite inconclusive in human studies. I'll come to that um, in a moment. But, you know, it is there that exercise can be making a significant improvement, okay, on, um, on brain size and brain health. So cognitive function, um, where we're looking at increases the neural growth, function, memory, <laughs> all comes. The Ericsson 2012 paper is where they look specifically at individuals with MS and they show a neuro, neural growth and, um, and an increased survival in the hippocampus. Obviously, the hippocampus is your main memory area. So it's been shown that it can happen, but there may be limitations to the degree that exercise can reserve, reverse age-related loss. So what this paper was saying is that you can improve um, the growth and the size of the hippocampus. However, if there has been significant decline to start with, you can't necessarily re fully reverse that decline. So again, that 2012 paper is really pushing for the fact that you need to be proactive and have individuals working at maintaining 
their hippocampal size and function rather than allowing it to decline and then try to improve it. So if anyone with MS is concerned about cognitive function, they need to be exercising. Um, Erickson also talks about the significant relationship between the increased blood flow to hippocampus and that improved memory. Um, the BOSS um, 2013 paper is quite interesting again about talking about engaging in a variety of activities that are novel, cognitively challenging and multimodal um, and more associated with protection against age-related cognitive decline. So this is a challenge to you as health professionals is how interesting is your exercise programs? How often do you rent, you know, do you change them up? Are you using interesting different bits of equipment? Is it just different colours of TheraBand, you know, um, balls? Is it, you know, there's so many um, good products out there, you know, kids dance mat products that we get out to use, you know, how interesting is the exercises you are giving, you know, standing on one leg is really boring, you know, do take that on, standing on one leg is a boring home exercise, how can you make that more goal directed, is it standing on one leg and the free leg is trying to write the alphabet or write your name, all of a sudden that whole exercise has got a different context on it and you are going to participate and do it more. So novel challenging stimulation is what maintains and improves cognitive function. So does your gym look a little bit like that mouse cage over there, full of real interactive challenging things to do? Or are you pretty much doing one leg standing, sit to stands and getting on an exercise bike, which we can all accept will get really boring after a while. So again, this paper by White and Constanialo um, has got just a really lovely table that I like to pull out. And again, it says 11 years old, the study. But they talk about this potential role of exercise, okay, and look at the brain health. The exercise has been shown to be neuroprotective, neuroregeneration, neurogenesis, and neuroplasticity are all available to happen. We also know about the immune modulation elements. So we've got the anti-inflammatory and the pro-inflammatory effects of exercise. We also know that exercise improves cardiovascular fitness, muscle strength, balance, bone density, cognition, mood, also reduces those secondary issues, overall enhancing quality of life. So the evidence is there, okay, or the conceptual frameworks are there with the evidence coming. So why do we still have an 80% of complete inactivity? Now, just to recap, because after I talk about all this fabulous evidence, I also have to put the disclaimer up that um, the Mottle 2017 paper um, is very interesting because unfortunately they do put to the fact that our numbers are small, our quality is low, and we're not longitudinal enough in our research. So though we've got all these really promising research studies that are showing a lot of stuff, and um, if you are going into research or you are involved in research, then, and I, same with myself, I'm about to embark on some research that try and make sure the numbers are decent enough try and make sure that you're getting some longitudinal study and um, but also just take on the fact that um there's so much regarding brain health and brain size we can't measure it yet there is so much about the human brain and about ms that we just don't know and if we sat and sat on our hands and waited until we knew exactly the true mechanisms of what was happening and how we were going to treat it, we could be sat here for a really long time with an 80% of inactivity rate continuing, which we know is all just going to be happening in one way, which is down. Okay, so we know that we can't stay as a status quo. We need to take some of this research and some of our general knowledge that exercise is going to be better than inactivity. The reason why there's a lovely little mouse on here is that um, it's really easy with animal studies because you can just bribe them with food. The ethical issues we have around human studies make us obviously harder to study. 
Um, so there is so much potential for positive change. So though we've got really limited evidence, do take on the positive part because um, the change is not going to be quick okay, or easy because if it was quick or easy to show the true mechanisms of the effect of exercise on the brain, we would know. We would have that information. The fact is we don't and we're not going to find it out in the next one or two years. It's going to be something that's going to take some time. So when you're working with individuals with MS, there is four pillars of brain health that you need to teach them as a health professional. This is what I believe, okay? And this is obviously being supported by research. Four pillars, the first one, and these are in no particular order of hierarchy, okay? They're all as important as each other, is the human brain has evolved to learn throughout its lifestyle, you know, lifetime. We see the biggest decline in brain health, okay, in cognitive function when people retire and they stop working and challenging their brain. Look at how many individuals with MS have to give up work. Now, do they have to give up work because of fatigue? Because of physical disability, okay, or cognitive, you know, difficulty. Now, all free probably, but there's a lot of individuals that stop work because they're exhausted and they can't do their job physically. Okay, now as soon as someone's not working, and we know there's a lot of individuals with MS who have retired early, well, their brain health is going to be um, declining quicker unless they fill that void. So one of the first things I ask all of my individuals, and this is for all brain health, so I ask every neurological condition, what are you doing to challenge your brain? Now, if they're in a job role, which is challenging and they're having to keep up to date with um, information and technology and learning new skills, that's great. If they're in a job that they could do with their eyes closed, then doing a job isn't good enough for their brain health. They also have to be learning something else new. So make sure they're learning something new. It can be anything. It can be open university. It can be learning knitting, woodwork. It could be learning a language, you know, learning to sing. It could be learning tango dancing. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be learning. The next one on there is obviously Mr. Sweaty Headband is exercise. Okay. Sorry, something's come up on my screen share. Get rid of that. Um, sorry about that. So um, the exercise chat there, we've said exercise is absolutely required for brain health. If you don't have exercise, and your brain will continue to decline. A little brain on the phone is social interaction. Okay, again, if you're not interacting socially, then cognitive decline happens. Um, if you're exhausted and your mobility declines and you've lost some self-efficacy, you're probably not going to go out and socialise anywhere near as easy as you did before. Also, especially with men, when they stop working, that's often where their social interactive group was. So if you're treating someone who isn't working, there's probably most of these areas that they're not ticking. And that last one, obviously, is sleep. And, um, and as we know, our individuals with MS often have quite big sleep issues. So going through sleep hygiene is obviously really important. So learn something new, exercise hard enough to get puffing and panting out of breath, stay socially interactive and get some good quality sleep. Now, Hello. what's too yes. paused for a, a breath to, uh, to have a drink? Can I ask a couple of questions? Go for it. Okay, so we have, um, sorry, let me just expand these so I can see them. So Suzanne asked, would you recommend the mini mental test as a quick screen? You can do, if you understand it. I don't, I don't do the mini mental test. Um, and I probably, I think it's probably the area, as I say, that as a physio, I, I don't actually know a huge amounts about, and it's something that we're looking at a little bit more, is if you're going to test something, is what are you hoping to prove by your retesting? Um, so I think the mini mental, you know, is obviously going on some memory. I would just wonder with a mini mental if it would show um, if it's, clinically sensitive enough to pick up someone with mild cognitive changes because we're talking about that mild executive functioning so um I would say 
have a look into it. It's a good question. I haven't I haven't used it myself, um, and I don't know of anyone else that's been using it through the literature. Like most of the cognitive testing that seems to be being done seems to be quite um, computer based. Um, executive functioning and working memory testing. Um, so I haven't seen anything on the mini mental. Well, Suzanne, I'll also email you on that and speak to our employment support services because I know they're doing some cognitive screening. So I'll um, I'll add a bit to that as well later. And then, um, Julie, I've got a couple of questions here for. Oh, a question here, sorry, from Judy, um, who's saying, could you please comment on the impact benefit of aqua therapy? Oh, I can, Judy, but can I come to that in the next couple of slides? Promise? You can. Okay, hydro versus land and MS. Yep, I will definitely talk about that because that's a love, but I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Great, thanks. Awesome. All right, I'm just going to, as I move my video, I might just, there we go. Hopefully everything is still there. Oh, hang on. Um, I think that's just taken me back to the original slide. Bear with me for a moment, everyone. There we go. Um, so MS and exercise, um, really briefly probably on this, is that um, we've got lots of research. All of these areas have been research so that we, uh, that we have a massive improvement on. So when people say, does exercise work for MS? Hell yeah, we should be shouting from the rooftops. You know, never let anyone question um, what, you know, if the benefits are there or not. They are absolutely there. Again, there's a fabulous paper by Robert Mottle in 2017, um, which he reports on all the high level evidence. So systematic reviews, meta-analysis and Cochrane reviews. OK, so I've just talked about how we don't have many good um, evidence regarding the actual brain function and cognitive you know, impact of exercise. So regarding improving physical fitness, we have one systematic review and two meta-analyses um, stating that exercise improves muscle strength um, and cardiovascular fitness. We've got two meta-analyses um, showing that walking can um, training make a clinically meaningful change in walking speed and endurance. Balance training, there's one meta-analysis showing significant beneficial effects. Fatigue, we've got two meta-analysis and one Cochrane review showing that there can be a moderate reduction in fatigue after regular exercise. We have free meta-analysis in exercise and depression. So exercise makes a significant improvement to depression, more so when actual physical activity guideline recommendation is met. And so I'll come to that later. And quality of life, we've got one systematic review as well. So that's just a slide there to show that we have got a lot of research and some really nice high quality research. So yes, exercise can make a significant effect on MS. So why so so back to this question of why so inactive? So we've got these barriers, um, and the two main barriers, I believe, are fatigue and heat sensitivity. Um, and we're going to come to um, come to that in the next couple of slides. As I mentioned, there's fear. We've got all these psychosocial factors, depression, lack of clear guidelines. Um, what was really interestingly picked up in a bunch of the research was that advice on exercise is one of the most unmet you know, the most commonly unmet need of people with MS. You know, as a physio, that's sad. That's a real sad statistic to hear, that advice and exercise is the most commonly unmet need. You know, that is just paving the way for our us, okay, as physical therapists and you um OTs, speech that, you know, we've all got a role, GPs to to change that difference there. So two main issues that individuals with MS really struggle with that I wanted to cover quickly is of what people are covering with fatigue and heat sensitivity. Educating an individual about their central fatigue so that a 30 to 50 percent, um, sorry, individuals with MS that their brain can be working 30 to 50 percent harder than someone without MS. So central fatigue is that their neurological system is working harder and that's not from a physical strain. 
that it's from, that is from anything that is a thought process, auditory and visual information. They have to switch their brain off in the day to have a rest. They need that 20 minute cognitive break. Every individual I treat with MS has to at least be taking one. And if their fatigue is bad, it's two of these breaks. It can be as short as 10 minutes if they want, but if they're ignoring their fatigue and they are just pushing on through every day and wondering why they're dragging themselves around and feel awful, then they're gonna carry on doing that until they really realize they need to take that rest. Our secondary fatigue factors, and I'm skipping through this quickly because I know that there is some great um, fatigue-based webinars that MS Connect already provides, so that all that information will be there for you already. But secondary fatigue is just remember that everything modifiable in their lifestyle, so get them to let you know what they're up to or what they think is making them tired. And what I want to focus on here is neuromuscular fatigue. So neuromuscular fatigue is that we have got partial innovation of a muscle okay and so that muscle runs out of its battery pack the mitochondria get depleted quicker in a partially innovated muscle compared to a fully innovated muscle this is why having to rest okay is allowing that mitochondria to be replenished for our um for our blood supply to then get the other part of training done so to manage neuromuscular fatigue and to get best outcomes is interval-based training. Also that heat sensitivity stuff is all about the pre-calling. The way that we do this really clinically is ice cold drinks. I do think the, the stainless steel thermos drink bottles have been an amazing invention that MS um, individuals have now. That's why I get them to make an ice slushy pour that into one of those thermos bottles and that's what they are to sit throughout their exercise session and um, to really try and keep that core temperature down. So the main thing is that what we know of exercise is that exercise does not make fatigue worse, it actually improves it. But what you have to really install a bit of um, uh, a bit of education with your individuals living with MS is about what is to be expected. A lot of them still have a huge amount of fear around symptoms. So for them to understand that it is normal and 100% normal to perceive and have some form of sensory changes while exercising. So double vision, pins and needles, neuromuscular fatigue, loss of balance, that is normal because of the heating of the central nervous system. So as soon as core temperature raises, okay, only by 0.5 degrees, the central nervous system speed declines, which is gonna make all those symptoms worse. It is normal for them to perceive those symptoms. They can last between 30 minutes to two hours, okay, of recovery. If they last for more than two hours, then they've probably done too much okay in that physical exertion but I wouldn't suddenly jump on that and go oh my god you've done too much too much I just kind of say well you know you might have just overdone it but it's probably also what else they did that day okay so just really educating them that this is normal okay it will happen and they can manage it with frequent rests with interval training and some nice cold ice cold water cooling vests, fans, and just trying to time management that they don't have to shoot off somewhere straight away as soon as they finish their exercise. So interval-based training, okay, it is, we've got high intensity interval-based training, which is talking about keeping your predicted heart rate max above 70, but generally between 80 to 95%. Okay, so that is really hard work. And it's anything of intervals that can range from 10 seconds to four minutes with active recovery, that's a lot less. Now with the clinical application I use of interval training, and you'll see this, I'm gonna show you a table in a moment, is I, um, I tend not to do active recovery because of the neuromuscular fatigue elements. I try and let them have a full recovery in the sense that they don't move at all. And I keep our intervals for actually only up to 45 seconds. Now I definitely would work someone longer, um, but I tend to find if you're doing just interval-based training is, um, is that they can get great intervals in about 
about 30 to 45 seconds. So there's some really nice research that's um, immersed in this area specifically with MS. Um, so the Johnson um, 2018 paper showed that high intensity interval training improved outcomes between 10 to 40 percent on moderate training. So this is not hit training compared to conservative, you know, um, control group doing nothing. This is hit training compared to your current normal exercise program is achieving 10 to 40 percent. Now, I'm an athlete, you know, I'm well, not quite an athlete, but I train hard myself. And if I knew that I could get 10 to 40 percent better outcome from just changing my training style um, and still putting the same amount of training in, I would take that. There's some great um, papers, Kapatkin 2015 and 16, who's a clinical researcher based out of the States. He's done some great stuff looking at strength training and walking distance and interval training. And he found that if you did, rather than two sets of 10, if you did four sets of four reps with a significant rest period, there was a significant improvement in strength gains compared to doing our normal conventional two sets of 10. He also looked at interval based walking. So he was doing a two minute intervals compared to um, continuous walking and found that the interval based group not only improved their walking speed, but their walking endurance was better than the endurance group at the end of the training. So he had some nice work there. The Campbell 2018 is actually a the first systematic review of um, studies with MS and interval based training and that was seven studies and four are randomized control and they all conclude that randomized con sorry they all conclude that high intensity interval training is safe and is likely to have more potential benefits than moderate exercise and also it can be quicker now we all live in um, a population that is getting more and more poor with our time management so anything that is quicker to produce the same or better results is becoming important so how do I deliver in intervals? Um, so you've got this as a handout here. So this is part of MS Get a Head Start, which is a six week program. That someone starting um, with you, and especially if they've got MS, they're potentially likely to have come from not doing much exercise and potentially extremely fearful. So 10 seconds, and you can all agree with me being health professionals, that 10 seconds is pretty much nothing in week one. Okay, they do this twice a week. This is on nine circuit exercises. So nine exercises in a circuit class. They do each exercise three times. So that first week at 10 second intervals is pretty much just to build confidence. OK, give them a bit of an idea about how to exercise and so that they leave the clinic going, oh, well, that was all right. And then you'll see quite quickly we build them up over the time to be up to about 45 second intervals. And if you've ever done any circuit training at 45 second intervals, that is really hard work. OK, so that's where we're getting some great changes. But this is at a one to one exercise and rest ratio. OK, that you're still allowing that neuromuscular fatigue management OK, to be covered um, when they're having that complete rest. So just wrapping up now, guys, because I know I'm coming towards the end, is that what I've talked about um, to date is that we've got a shocking 80% of individuals with MS are completely inactive, and that has not changed for 25 years. We know that there is significant grey matter um, degeneration at diagnosis, which is a, have an effect on cognition and physical um, abilities. Often in our industry, we are testing physical um, impairments and not probably doing enough cognitive testing, even though our um, individuals we're treating, our population with MS, are probably most fearful about losing cognition. There is evidence galore out there to show that exercise has a positive effect on the brain and we can use that conceptual hypothesis in the MS world as well and we've already seen that exercise does improve things like hippocampal volume etc. We know now that 
interval based training um, seems to be more apparent in MS because we can avoid neuromuscular fatigue. But we also know that the higher we get the heart rate, the more brain drive neurotrophic factor release that we're getting as well to help with that element of brain health. So these are all the things that MS Get A Head Start has been essentially pinned on. So MS Get A Head Start is a therapist led six weeks and it's a one hour twice a week program. It's hydrotherapy or land and I will talk about the hydrotherapy part in a moment so do hold breath please. It's that progressive intervals as demonstrated on the other one but the real key points about it is it covers six, over the six weeks, we cover six educational topics. So we cover fatigue management, exercise principles, pain management, um, cognitive and psychological well-being, other services. So that's where we talk about the whole MDT program. And then we talk about where to from here. What we know with MS and programs is often um, compliance to an exercise program while it is being run is high drop out when the program finishes from maintaining any form of exercise is also high that they don't maintain and continue it so a huge amount of the program is also built around building self-efficacy and self-management so there's a whole um, self-reflection element there is recording exercise um, times and amounts during the week so by the time someone comes to the end of the six weeks they have improved their self-efficacy they have knowledge on those six um, core areas of education of self-management and they know how to exercise for their MS and they're not scared because if you haven't exercised for years and someone says to you you've got to exercise hard enough to get puffing and panning out of breath then you're probably going to be a little bit nervous about that. It's also a program that is aimed at the newly diagnosed. We Again we kind of want to see people before these issues become as bigger issues as what they do, rather than what we're doing at the moment, which seems to be trying to play catch up with those secondary impairments. So the aims of um, MS Get A Head Start is all about installing hope. As I say, no one gives you a manual when you get diagnosed with MS. Um, and essentially, MS Get A Head Start is now the manual. Okay, it provides you with everything you need to know regarding those key elements of self-management okay it's about that self-efficacy and self-empowerment and providing that positive journey okay because i do believe that the journey of ms can be considerably changed with programs like this so while there's a picture of me by a hydro pool i would just make it spend um a bit a lot on hydro and ms i absolutely love hydrotherapy on ms there is some great um research studies out there one in particular um, by Bansi, 2012, off the top of my head, where they compared individuals on an exercise bike in water compared to individuals exercising on land. These are obviously individuals all with MS. The individuals who were in the pool on the exercise bike achieved better outcomes, including increased levels of brain drive neurotrophic factors. They're not quite sure why the pool had that effect, but it does. Um, I find hydro amazing when you are treating um, a range of physical impairments um, and also physical abilities that you could have someone who is newly diagnosed and essentially unimpaired to someone who might be walking with two crutches. You put them in the pool and they can all do a lot more than what they can do on land. So it's a lot more empowering. Um, as I say, I think there's a lot of other benefits around hydro regarding its buoyancy, the warming effect regarding reducing um, some of the spasmodic issues they may have, pain, you know, and hypersensitivity, again, can all be supported, as well as massive balance. If you're trying to run group classes or you've got worried about individuals and safety, I do believe that hydro has many benefits. So MS Get A Head Start was initially completely set up in the pool, um, and then the reality reality is, is lots of um, facilities can't access a pool or their hydro pools have been taken away from them. So we've now run the program on land as well um, and you can get this, you know, just as good results. But I am a big believer that the hydro pool is fantastic for individuals with NS. 
So why is MS Get a Head Start and why are other programs like MS Get a Head Start? Obviously, it's a program I developed, so I will preach about it. You know, unfortunately, I will. But I completely also agree that there's probably other programs that, if they're not there yet, will be coming out similar to it. But we have got an inconsistency in care. We need to stop cotton wool approaching. We need to stop working people at easy, moderate levels. They need to sweat. They need to get out of breath. They need to feel what DOMS is. They need to feel what delayed onset of muscle soreness actually is following strength training. We have a lot of unanswered questions and I think we can't wait to make till the research answers those questions. We've just got to address the fact we've got an 80% inactivity issue happening. Um, take away that real thought today about what is primary versus a secondary impairment. And I can pretty much guarantee that you are treating a whole round of secondary impairments and they are going to be your biggest issue. And inactivity is reducing life expectancy. So we, there is a need for reliable resources that are evidence based, progressive and also individualised. So how much exercise is needed? So um, the Canadian Latimer Chiang in 2013 brought out a, um, uh, a physical activity guideline with MS and they talked about um, doing aerobic training twice a week and strength training twice a week. So do have a little look at that if you are wanting some more structured guidelines. And um, from a brain health point of view, we're looking at three to four times a week of getting absolutely puffing and panting out of breath. But it can be as short as three sets of 30 second sprints. OK, it does not need to be very long. It's just literally getting out of breath for a short period. Um, they reckon from a World Health Organization point of view that you need to be doing at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise just to maintain normal human bodily function, you know, fitness. So if we've got an 80% inactivity issue, we definitely aren't hitting 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity. As I say, strength training is required and even more important over the age of 40 because of your sarcopenia, okay, the loss of muscle tissue with aging. Um, and then very briefly, 10,000 steps loving this topic at the moment because everyone loves to challenge um, things and if you've watched much of the media there's a huge challenge on where did 10,000 steps come from and yet it's an arbitrary figure like someone did not essentially pluck 10,000 steps out of the air but they did kind of roughly go for it when people quiz me on this what I actually then uh, tell people is that through um, the human body and the evolution that we had to become a human body is that we are designed to walk about 40,000 steps a day, not 10. We are designed to walk all of the time, be on our feet all day. It's only from 150 years ago with an industrial revolution and 30 years ago with a technology revolution that we got fairly lost in only one and a half generation. And if you know anything about evolution rates is that we have not evolved to cope at all with our industrial or technological revolution and um, is that we should actually still be walking 40,000 steps. So in fact, if anyone is at 10,000 steps, they're doing great. OK, and we know a lot of our individuals would not even be anywhere near that. Now, some of those who've got neuromuscular fatigue or weakness aren't going to be able to achieve 10,000 steps. So they need to um, complement that with some other form of exercise, swimming, cycling, you name it. So take home messages. So a bit of a whirlwind at the end there, but aware of time and I can talk forever. So sorry, but proactively manage fatigue because if someone's fatigue isn't being addressed, OK, then they're never really going to find the energy to exercise. Exercise needs to be hard enough to get out of, out of breath. Stop cotton wool wrapping people. Use interval based training. So that's things like um, Kapatkin's four sets of four instead of two sets of 10. Um, and also things like three sets of 30 seconds with a 30 second rest. And make sure they're learning something new. OK, think about those four pillars of brain health. OK, and how you can be helping individuals at diagnosis from both a physical and a cognitive approach. So um, if you're interested in learning more, the MS Good Head Start program's got lots of information on it and the website detail is there. And I would just like um, to always finish on a picture like this, that yes, exercise 
is essential. Um, and thank you very much. And I will hand it over to Nicola if there's any more questions that have come up. Julie, thank you very much. There are some questions and you have inspired me to uh, get off my office chair and uh, go and get out of breath after this webinar. So uh, thank you. Um, so some of the questions we've got, I think you may have covered in some capacity, but um, if you could answer them some briefly, that would be great. Um, so we've got one here from um, from Sarah, oh, sorry, from Revathy saying, hi, Julie, how many days would you recommend for an MS client to be exercising per week? Is three to four days sufficient? I think you might have addressed that in that previous table. Yeah, I'll just, yeah, I will just comment on that briefly. So as I say, we need them to be getting out of breath about three to four times a week from a brain health cardiovascular point of view. They need to be doing something twice a week from a strength training point of view. So you're kind of looking at someone exercising, you know, a minimum of three, but probably three to five days from exercise point of view. That is not physical activity, okay? What we need to make sure is that they are physically doing something at a moderate level for at least 30 minutes every day. And this is where we've really got to educate um, individuals living with MS, the difference between doing some structured exercise compared to you have a human body that was evolved to be physically active 16 hours a day and you're potentially not doing anything. So it's quite a hard one for them to take on and to swallow, but you know, yes, structured exercise three to five days a week, but physically active every day. And Julie, that's quite a lot for people who've if they're inactive to go to and Sue raises a point here she says a barrier to people with MS doing regular exercise is fatigue any tips to encourage people to engage with exercise when they're totally wrecked how how do you start when how yeah. do you start people off yeah I think it's it's a tricky one um, and I think there's two things to start is when they're totally wrecked is first of all are they taking if they're totally wrecked they need to be taking two 20 minute rests every day talk about things like circadian rhythms those rests need to be at the same time every day and a rest is a rest it is not on your phone on the computer you know watching tv it is either sleeping or guided meditation with headphones in so that's the main thing that most people aren't are they drinking at least two liters of water and I would probably question that if they're not then of course they're going to be fatigued because their brain will be like a raisin so I get them doing those two things and I also give them lots of education on the fact that if they're really exhausted what we know is exercise is going to make a positive difference that they've got to start somewhere and we as I say we could be talking as little as three sets of 30 seconds with 30 seconds rest so we're looking at them stumming up enough energy to do three minutes of activity and we know that that's possible so often um it's hard when someone is almost stuck in that i'm exhausted i can't see you know you know the uh, wood from the trees we know that fatigue has a massive impact also with depression and depression equals fatigue so hence why i think programs that are group based okay that is really getting someone initially out and started and feeling supported and hence why our program starts with that 10 second intervals which is really short so yeah to recap drinking two litres of water, they must be proactively managing their fatigue, try and get them to start something, even if it's something just really small. Thanks, Julie, that's that's great. And um, I think three minutes sounds achievable, doesn't it? That sounds like uh, something that, that anybody could do. Um, and one final question, please, was around ice drinks for individuals. Any suggestions for ice drinks that uh, for individuals that may um, trigger tri trigeminal neuralgia with colds, so somebody who's sensitive. Yeah, that um, I would probably say if they find consuming an ice cold drink sets off their trigeminal neuralgia, then I'd probably say maybe not the drink. Um, if they've tried with a straw, like because sometimes it's obviously the the 
the tooth sensitivity, if they've got sensitive teeth, that can obviously then be a faster action obviously to that trigeminal nerve. So if they've tried consuming with a um, ice car or water for a straw, the other thing is I'd go for a cooling vest, you know. Okay. Um, We've got ice vests. There's some research that you could have your ice vests in your waiting room, okay, and someone comes in and they come in 10 minutes early or 15 minutes early before a treatment and they put their ice vest on, okay, as well as potentially completing the exercise without. Um, now, I know, I think it's the MS Society, you guys do partially funded ice vests or something, I think, in Aussie, am I correct? We do have some neckties that are partially funded. I think there's I there's a there is a company that does ice vests in Australia that if you say you're an MS Society member, they do a bit of a discount. Um, but I have also been playing around that I got an ice vest of some sort from AliExpress that cost me all of $25, um, which seems to be working pretty well as well. So, you know, a lot of these things don't need to be the big expensive pieces of equipment. You know, you can pick up things that are definitely a lot more cost effective as well. Beautiful, thank you so much, Jilly. And I'm just going to, on behalf of uh, our audience, just thanks again. And I'm just gonna run through some very quick um, services. So thanks, Jilly, thank see you, you soon. Go. Okay, so just in two minutes, just want to very quickly identify some of the services that we provide both for health professionals and for your clients. So there is uh, plenty of NDIS um, support, there's employment support services. Um, we run plenty of webinars for both client and health professionals. So there's lots of education, there's peer support, etc. And this wheel shows some of the services that we deliver. We have MS Practice, which is a free online education and support for health professionals, and there's the web address there. We are an NDIS provider, so please do refer your clients to us as appropriate, and they can reach us through this MS Connect. Uh, you can enrol for Inform, which is the health professional um, monthly newsletter that's got some uh, information about it's upcoming still, still webinars. About, and, yeah. and again, if you wish to contact us you can reach us through ms connect on 1800 042 138 so thanks very much for your time we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar bye for now